glasses off so I can't see your faces. So you're all a blur. Well, a generation is gone. Mom was the last one in her family. They're all gone now. Mom, our respective fathers, her siblings, our grandparents. It was funny because when I said that mom was the last one, one of you looks up and said, well, you're the new matriarch. So for one day only, I'm gonna be your matriarch. I remember most of you when you were little. There's David and Michael. David's in Ohio, Michael's in Texas. We were very close, March, April, May, 64, 65, 66. But I remember the trouble we used to get into. I remember the first time I met Peaches. She was six months old and I was 10. The second time she was two and I was 12. I was 14 when Donnie was born and mom was very sick. He was three months premature. We brought him home when he was four months. He fit in a little shoe box, but mom couldn't take care of him for those first, that first year, so I did. So for the first two years, he would call me mom and when I would bring him here, there were people that thought I was his mom. So when Peaches and I went away to foster care, he struggled for a little bit. Larissa, surprise, surprise, was born when I was 18 and a freshman in college. I didn't see a lot of her childhood. I think the first time I met her, she was almost two. The next time, eight. She stole all my jeans. The next time, <laughs> when she was a teen, All week long, I've thought about mom's death and how it's gonna affect each of us and the legacy that mom left behind. I thought about what it must have been like for her as she exhaled her last breath of air from this world and took her first breath in heaven. What did she feel? Now at this point, I'm gonna take a lot of poetic license, probably not biblical, but I just want you to sit back and imagine with me what mom must have felt. And for those who ask, no, there are not wheelchairs in heaven. Grandma is not crawling around on the grass. God tells us that the lame will walk, the blind will see, and the deaf will hear. So mom's got new legs. So in my mind, I imagined in that instant what she felt for the first time as she took that last breath and exhaled here, and then took a big breath in heaven. For the first time, mom felt peace. The peace that passes all understanding, the peace that only God can give. And the weight of the world and all the pain that she lived in her whole life just fell from her shoulders. Mom wore her pain and bitterness and her anger like a worn coat. It was stained, torn, and tattered. She could never bring herself to take that coat off even though she had come to a saving knowledge of Christ. She didn't know how to let go of her past. That was the legacy that our family passed down to mom. And that's the legacy that's been passed down to us. In my mind's eye, I could see mom maybe falling to her knees after she greeted the Lord, maybe weeping. And then I thought, if mom could come back, which is not possible, but if she could come back for just five or 10 minutes, what would she say? And as a mother, I could, I could just imagine. I mean, my heart would break. I think the first thing she would probably do is walk down the aisle and grab each one of you by the hand. And I think she would beg you to find it in your heart to forgive her for all the pain and the suffering that was caused. Most of you went up and spent time with her before she passed. I'm sure some of you asked her to forgive you. Some of you asked, said that you would forgive her. And some of you probably told her how angry you still were. I imagined mom trying to warn us about not letting go of our past so as to not cause ourselves and others the same pain that we inherited. She would encourage you to let go of the bitterness and the anger, the resentment and the hate. 
I spent the better part of 35 years talking to mom about letting go and letting God work in her life and give her the healing that only Jesus Christ can do for her because only he can take all that away. But mom was afraid. She said she couldn't face her past, the past of her own abusive childhood and of passing that legacy on to us. She would beg you now because she understands. Now she's free from all of it. It was left to us though. And it's not a legacy any of us should continue. But only with the help of Jesus Christ can we end that generational legacy. And it is generational. But it's our turn. My dad told my brother when he was young about some of his mom's childhood. Most of us have been through the same thing mom went. Dad said, don't hold our actions against her. As children, we develop our own ways to cope and to survive. But as adults, we sit here today, we all have choices, as did mom. Don't let those destructive emotions or the pain from our childhood bind you up in the way it did mom. She couldn't see while she lived here, but she sees it now. We can be free from the bonds of our past. And we can know what real joy and happiness can be. But the only way to do that is to give it over to the Lord. He's the only way. He's the truth. And he's the life. It isn't too late. We're all going to have to grow up now. We'll have to adult on our own. But we have choices. And these are the choices that mom had too. Hatred is a choice. Negativity is a choice. Resentment is a choice. Anger is a choice. Revenge is a choice. Optimism is a choice. Compassion is a choice. Forgiveness is a choice. Empathy is a choice. Joy is a choice. Happiness is a choice. How we live our one given life, the only life we have, is a choice. Don't leave today without making the right choice. The first choice, the most important choice, is surrendering to the Lord. Because only he can give you the peace from your past. Only he can set us free from it. When I looked at mom in the hospital room, honestly, I was kind of numb. I didn't feel anything. I sat there and prayed and said, Lord, just let her come home. Let's end her physical pain, and let's end her emotional pain. And I think mom wanted to die alone, which is why she hung in there until everyone left. I got to sing, I sat there when I was by me alone, and I sang the one song that mom liked. It was the song she asked me to sing when Michael passed away. And several of you today asked me to sing it here for mom. As I sat in the hospital room singing it to her, that one eye popped open. <laughs> and that arm started swinging around, so I wasn't quite sure if she was telling me to stop or trying to smack me or just rejoicing. I'm going to choose the rejoicing. Why do you keep going? But um, this was a song that mom liked. So let's pray for me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch, a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that told 
services like this is found in Philippians uh, chapter uh, number 2 and the uh, scripture says according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that with all bones as always and now also Christ shall be magnified in my body whether it be by life or by death for me to live is Christ and then the apostle Paul says to die is gain but if I live in the flesh this is the fruit of my labor thinking about the focus of Philippi yet what shall I choose I want not as a choice to be made I'd like to be in heaven, he says. I am in a twixt, twixt the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. And we say amen to that. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. The apostle is saying that uh, right now it's necessary that I stay here and uh, because you need me. And uh, so I will uh, stay here until the Lord finishes with me. I uh, have known uh, most of this family for many years, some of this family for many years. I have been here for 44 years. I know I don't look that old. <laughs> but 44 years, and uh, lived, if I live to see May of next year, and uh, have preached a thousand funerals, but uh, have uh, hundreds of messages. But today I wrestle a little bit about what to say, what God want me to do, and, and, and the message that I preached this morning I, in the uh, uh, 8 o'clock service and the 10 o'clock service, and uh, it's December, it's the time we celebrate the, the saving, the coming of the Lord, and uh, in Matthew's gospel chapter 1, the scripture says that he 
or she shall bring forth a son that shall call his name Jesus. Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now in John's gospel is a very precious verse. Oh, they're all precious, but you know what I mean. In John chapter number 6 and in verse number 40, John 6 and verse 40. The Bible says, and this is the will of him that sent me. This is the will of him that sent me. And everyone which seeth the Son, capital S, and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him, her, whoever, up. At the last day, this is not the end, okay? But Matthew tells us that we have a Savior. God sent us a Savior in Matthew chapter uh, number 1. And uh, the word, his name is Jesus. And uh, the, uh, the scoop, when you think about the word Savior... The word Savior, S-A-V-I-O-U-R, that's the word it's used in the King James Bible, the authorized edition. And uh, the word Savior is used 25 times in the New Testament. Now, I don't know whether Webster and his, uh, were trying to get away from England's English and uh, whether it's just some uh, something I don't know about, but uh, he brought the word down to S A V I O R, left the U out. I, and I, I, I always ask people, well, how would you like to be left out? Like say, <laughs> but it's S A V I O U R in the King James Bible, and the word savor or savior, S A V I O R, without the U. Mean ones that one that saves from danger or destruction. A person can run into a burning building and, and grab you and bring you out, or go to the car that's wrecked and bring you, or dive in the water and save you. They can be your savior, S A V I R or S A V E R. But savior, S A V I O U R, is used with identification with. Jesus Christ because he's the only one that can ha have the title S-A-V-I-O-U-R you can't be one of those you can't be a savior now you can be a saver but only Jesus Christ the only way the word savior with the you can properly be used is with the person Jesus Christ and God says I'm sending you a savior with a you it means the word savior or Jesus Christ as savior means preserver <clears throat> it means deliverer it means it speaks of God and Christ as sustainer of the church his body with reference to his incarnation, it is a testimony of the deity of Jesus Christ, of who he is. S A V I O U R. That's what we all need is a Savior. That's why God sent him. Bible says he came into his own, his own received him not. But the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let me read you a couple of verses. John 4, verse 42. And we know that this is indeed the Christ, the S A V I O U R of the world, Savior. Philippians 3, verse 20. 
For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, join the Trinity, Deity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. A commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. First Corinthians, or First Timothy chapter 4 says, We trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially to those that believe. What does that mean? He's the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. When Christ died on the cross, he made atonement sufficient for all men. Atonement has been made. Jesus Christ, the Savior, has made it possible for all men to be saved. The whole world. He is the deliverer, the preserver of all mankind. God, Jesus Christ holds it all together. If he takes and removes his hand, we're gone. Life is in Christ. But the Savior from sin of those who believe. Now he's died and atoned for all men, but especially for those that believe. There's a difference in being atoned for and receiving the atonement. The atonement sin of sin for those who believe. The Bible says, for by him are all things created, Colossians, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be of thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created by him and for him, and he is. You ever think about what the little word is means? <laughs> He is before all things, and by him all things consist. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. Now the word is means as it now is, without change from its present condition. When someone is something, that's what they is, okay? Let's play with this way. Is, is the third person singular present indicative to be? I'll give you an English lesson today. I is what I is. I be what I be. I are what I are. <laughs> Jehovah God told Moses in Exodus chapter number 3 and verse 14. Moses said, Lord, who in the world am I going to say sent me? He said, you tell them I am have sent me because I am who I am. And that, and that you can't change that. He's not what you want him to be. He is what he is God. We are not. We need to get over that. Amen. He is. And he's not giving up his rights. Okay. And so. Now. What you want, now not what you want me to be, but I am what I am. It is his position, and he's not going to give it up. John, 1 John 4, verse 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son. Why did the Father send the Son? If you could save yourself, if a church could save you, a baptismal watch could save you, or the Ten Commandments could save you, or good works could save you, or being a good guy could save you, doing the best you can could save you, why did God send his son? Mm. If anything else, he's the only Savior that saved you. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. That's everybody. 
That's everybody who believes. Everybody, everyone has been made atonement for. It's up to you to receive the pardon. Believe the report and say yes to Jesus Christ, the Savior. Now in John, of course, we read in chapter 6, 49 years ago in the back row of Baptist Church in Collinsville, Virginia, a few days before that, I awoke in jail. And uh, I, I was not unusual for me to wake up in jail. I had a drug problem, I had an alcohol problem, and I had an attitude problem. And so uh, I woke up one day in jail. I had married a wonderful, don't tell me, ask me how it happened. It had to be a miracle of God, but I married a wonderful Christian lady, girl. She was only 16. I convinced her before she'd get any older to know any better, okay? I was 18, she was 16. You say, how'd you get her to marry you? I lied to her. I told her she wouldn't have to work, you know. The same thing you did to get the woman to marry you, fellas. I lied to her. But anyway, uh, she was in Winston to me. I wake up at night, my wife would get into the bed praying, oh God, please save, please save my husband. Please don't let my husband go to hell. And so when I'm going to deal with this, it's got to be something better than this. So I got up that Sunday morning, I said, I'm going to go to the church. She fainted, I revived her. And uh, we went off to God's house, amen. And I heard the simple message, Jesus, the Savior. Come unto me, all your labor. Man, I was laboring. You're heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I need some rest. And I, I said, you know, all I have to do is believe on what Jesus Christ is. Tell him that back row, hold on to that pew. I bowed my head. That's Jesus. You see? <laughs> I went out different than I came in. The Holy Ghost of God arrested my soul. He came into my heart, squares in my heart, my heart of hearts, and made juice come out of my eyes. Jesus, the Savior. In that verse in John chapter 6, it says, in verse number 40, And this is the will of him that sent me, Jesus says, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have you for everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. There's a promise there. The promise is everlasting life. Now, everlasting life in this body that I'm in does not excite me. I mean, if it's this bad in 73 years, what's going to look, look like in 73 more, okay? Mm -hmm. It's only going to get worse. And uh, I know you're not going to believe this, but there was a time, a long time ago, I was a handsome man. <laughs> oh, yeah. You don't have to believe that one second. But anyway, uh, it only gets worse in this body. And uh, the fact of the matter is, there's a place where there is no more sin, and there is no more suffering, there is no more... Uh, sickness, and there is no more sorrow and tears. And there is no more separation from family. There's a place. And there's a promise here. Now, Moses, when he was on the mount talking to God, he said, let, let, let me see you. I want to see you. And God says, you can't see me, Moses. No man see me and can live. You die. But let's see the shadow of my hinder parts of pass by. Let's see my shadow. And Moses saw the shadow of God's hinder part as he passed by. And Moses, and in this body, his face was, he was faced with so a glow. He had to put a bag over his head to go back down to see the children of Israel. He was a glow from just seeing God's hinder part. On the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus goes up on the mountain and carries a couple of disciples with him, but Moses appears. And Jesus, on the Mount of Transfiguration, and his, and he was in a, a picture of a glorified body. And Moses could look upon him because Moses was dead. The only way you can look upon the glorified body of Jesus Christ, the glorified person, is to be dead and have a new body. If God would have walked in this room and his glorified self, we'd all be crystallized. We couldn't handle it. That's why he's going to give us a new body and Linda 
in that day when the resurrection takes place, right now her spirit's with the Lord. One day she's going to have a resurrected, glorified, all of God's children are going to have a resurrected, glorified body. Those that believe. It's a promise. There's a purpose. He that sent me, God has a will. He sent Jesus Christ. God has a, a plan. There's a plan. There's a proposal. He that seeth and believeth. In my mind's eye, by faith, I went to a place called Calvary 49 years ago. And I seen the Son of God hanging on a cross, taking my place. If I got what I deserved, I'd be crucified on a cross. Jesus took my place. And if you got what you deserved, you would die and go to hell. The only way to know what Jesus Christ suffered is to die and go to hell and spend eternity there. Then you'll be able to know what Christ suffered on the cross for you. But he did the suffering. Took my place. The purpose he that sent me. The Father's will, the proposal, the proposition is uh, seeth and uh, believe it. When Jesus died on the cross, he said it's finished. Everything it takes to get you and I to heaven, he has done it. There's nothing left to be done. He did it all. All you have to do is believe. Receive the pardon. A century ago, there was a brother in prison. I forget his name. Forget the president. But the man was in prison, prison under capital punishment. He was, he was going to be uh, hanged. And uh, the uh, president pardoned him. They took the pardon to the prison. They released the man from prison. And uh, he refused the pardon. They had to go back to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled that if a man doesn't receive the pardon, he's not pardoned. And he was executed. You have a pardon paid for at Calvary's cross, but you have to receive it. Mm -hmm. The pardon is the pardon. And so there's a proposition, there's a proposal, there's a plan. This is the will of God for people to be saved. There's the promiser. I will raise him up. I will raise him up. Now, is that encouraging or not? Every grave of every redeemed person, God made a promise. I'm going to raise him up. Death is not the end. God says, I give unto them eternal life everlasting life. In order to accomplish that, he went to the grave. The book of Hebrews tells us that there's a new covenant. Hebrews chapter 9, I believe it is. And that Jesus Christ in this new covenant, in order for the new, it's called the last will and testament. In order for my children to receive what I have worked for all my life, I have to leave a, a will. But the will is no good. My, neither one of my sons nor my daughter can come to my house and say, we want what's, long, what's coming to us. I have to die for them to get the last will and testament. An attorney, a lawyer, will read them the last will and testament when I die. Jesus Christ gave a last will and testament, but he had to die were to be delivered. But that ain't the end of the story. You need a lawyer to be able to process the last will of testament. Jesus, in the same verse, says he is our advocator. He is our attorney. So not only did he die, he resurrected from the grave to deliver the covenant. The, next, the last will of testament. So not only did he die to make, it, to make it possible for us to receive eternal life, but he resurrected from the grave to deliver it. He's for alive forevermore. That's why he's the only Savior. He's the only one that can save. So I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can love the Father but by me. Oh, what a Savior. 
Now, God sends nobody to hell. I, I don't believe that God's mad at anybody today. I don't believe that God's mad at anybody. There's a day coming, a day, that God's wrath is going to be executed. It's going to, his Bible says in John 3, his wrath is unto the lost man. There's coming a day where God's going to, he's going to exercise his wrath. <coughs> but that's to those who have rejected his son. All you have to do is receive his son, Jesus Christ. God is not angry at you. He knows what you are. He knows what I am. He knows I'm a sinner. He knows my downfalls and my upcomings. He knows when he saved me 49 years ago, I'd mess up along the way. He knew that I wouldn't be perfect. He knew I would be the perfect dad. Every one of my children left home at 18 years old. They couldn't handle it any longer. Being in a preacher's home. I was tough. Really, I wasn't. I was soft. <laughs> but you know what? All I'm back, all I'm in church today, all I'm serving God. See, the Bible promises me that they won't believe the teaching that I taught them. They never got away from it. One by one. Now, I'm not as dumb as they thought I was when they were 18. That can be one man to them now. But there's a promise. That promise is everlasting life. This is the, the B I B L E. That's the basic information before leaving Earth. The Bible. Okay. There's a lot of things you can be wrong about. I don't believe about hell, heaven stuff, and Jesus cross. I don't believe all that stuff. I just think you just do the best you can and live a good life and just do the best you can. You don't want to die wrong about that. Amen. No. A lot of things you be wrong about. The consequences may not be too severe. You know? You don't, if you're wrong about your electric bill and you don't pay it, uh, the worst thing you have to cut your lights off. Pay it to get like back on. But if you die, wrong about who Jesus Christ is, there's no coming back. There's no changing your mind. The rich man, the Bible says in Luke 16, lift up his eyes in hell. He was wrong about some things. I believe today that Linda would have me tell you about Jesus Christ. Forty-nine years ago, I went to work. I didn't like going to work then. I don't like going to work now. But I went to work. I had a family. And my wife put this gospel track, one like this one, in my dinner bucket. I worked the graveyard shift. They call it graveyard for a reason. Eleven to seven. You eat beans for breakfast and eggs for supper and you're all confused. But she put this in my dinner bucket. This was your life. Gospel tract. I opened up my dinner bucket and there it was. And I laughed. And my drug buddy was across the table from me. Donnie Shelton. Him and I did drugs together. Jerry Hopkins was one of my drug buddies. His brother is in the penitentiary. All my buddies are in the penitentiary are dead. Except for Jerry Hopkins. <laughs> Jerry Hopkins shot his dad through the kitchen window with a 38 revolver. Shot it, emptied it in his chest. As he's beating his mama, he's walking towards him. You know, if he didn't kill his dad, dad would kill him. Lincoln Hopkins was his name. Shot him and killed him. And they didn't do nothing to, to, to uh, uh, Jerry Hopkins for that. Back in those days, they didn't put kids in prison, okay, for killing their dad if he was beating their mom. But Jerry was there, Donnie Shelton, and my wife put this in my dinner bucket. This was your life. And I pulled it out, and I laughed, and I give it to Donnie. I said, Here, Donnie. You need this. And laughed. I drove a forklift, loaded tractor in front of trucks. He drove one all night. He was backed up in the corner. Reading that gospel track. And he comes to me about the time he got off work. He says, is this, is this true? He'd never been to church in his life. Is this true? I said, my wife gave it to me. My wife's one of them Christians. If she gave it to me, it's true, buddy. And Sunday night at 11 o'clock when I come back to work, Donnie came in. His, I, got, I went to church Sunday. He said, I got 
saved. I said, what? You've got to be kidding me. My drug buddy is saved. My wife is saved. What chance do I have here, okay? Donnie began to talk to me, and my wife talked to me on the other side, and then I got out of jail next week. I went to jail and went to jail, went to church. <laughs> and I've been giving these out. I have Walmart, and I'm not going to I go. I said, this track right here, uh, uh, it helped get me saved. I said, you read this track, it'll help you. Read this track, it'll help you. I've been giving them out in the way. Because there's nothing any more important than knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I'm not afraid of COVID-19. I got to die or something. <laughs> I'm one of the worst risk. I, I never wear a mask. I shake everybody's hand, hug people, go to all the stores, come to church. And uh, here am I. But of course, that's all going to change tomorrow because you're going to put out new regulations. And now I'm going to mark chairs and all that kind of thing. Isn't, isn't, it, isn't it amazing to you that no more people have died in America this year than died last year? Really? No more people have died in America this year than died last year. It's a miracle. There's hardly anybody dying of heart attacks. Nobody dying of cancer. Heard anybody dying of the flu? No. Everybody's dying of COVID-19. It's amazing. And so uh, I think it's all a, a political whatever, but that's my opinion. I got entitled to it. It's like belly buttons. Everybody's got one. And uh, that's just the way I feel about it. Now, do I, I wish people wear a mask? Hallelujah. Thank God for them. Amen. You're not, you're not, uh, you're helping me. I'm killing you, but you're helping me. But uh, thank God for my wear a mask. I'm not the one place to have to. I get my private place so they had to wear a mask. I asked the guy at a store in, in Springfield. I thought they got to wear a mask. And I went to the store up there, lumber store, and I said, he said, you got to have a mask on. I said, well, I have a medical problem. And uh, he said, uh, I said, he said, what is it? I said, I, I have to breathe. And, I, and I, I said, if I pass out, will you revive me? He said, well, I'll call 911. I said, well, thank you. Yeah. So I put a mask on. But... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's, you know, if you ain't a little bit crazy, then you're not a little bit anything. Uh, I'm very forgetful now that I'm old. You forgetful yet? You're not old yet. Yeah. My wife had me do something the other day, and I said, she said, I told you to do it. I said, no, you didn't. In 1999, I had a brain aneurysm. They aired back me to Fairfax and gave me 40 hours to live. Doctor came in and said, got two choices. Go for it. He said, no surgery, you die. Get torch two, torch two. He said, surgery, probably gonna die anyway. I said, that's not a choice. <laughs> and uh, my wife said, I'll go ahead and have a surgery. Doctor, you got any questions? I said, just one. He said, what is it? I said, do you know Jesus as your personal savior? And he said, look to my wife. And he, she said, you asked, you answered. And uh, he said, well, I pray to God in my own way. And I knew he wasn't a Christian because I'd really have a Christian doctor who loved Jesus praying, you know, operating on me, but I, I got an even operating on me, so I figured, well, I didn't need more prayer. Took me into surgery, the bleeding stopped, they couldn't find the aneurysm, and they brought me back out and said, we'll give him 48 hours and he'll be dead. That was in 1999. And uh, 12 days later, they let me out of Fairfax trauma and sent me home, did another, another arteriogram two weeks later. The doctor says, I can't explain it. God ain't done yet. It's not my time. I'm going to die or something. But not, not on January the 24th, 1999. I made it through that day and I made it. And if I'll have, I have another anniversary in uh, January 24th. It, uh, I, made it, I made it. But uh, one day that number will come up. And when I go to heaven, I will not be upset about it. And uh, my children... They'll let fly for a while. They'll get through my bank account. <laughs> no. But uh, you got to die. The most important thing is being ready. And I want to encourage you. If, I, if, if Linda were here today, uh, she may not have uh, told a whole lot of people. may not have been a lot of very good witness. may have been a great witness. I don't know, but she would tell you today. Eternity 
is real. Heaven is real. And you need to understand, we're just, how many days? 27,000, whatever it was. And then there's forever. We spend all of our effort on the nasty now and now. And that this little nasty now and now is over, there is forever. So what's important? It's important that you know Jesus Christ. And uh, I believe it really did. I've talked to her. She's always excited about things like the Lord, talking about the Lord. And all of that 27,554 days. And amen. And then there's forever. By the way, I have plenty of these little tracks if you want one. This was your life. And uh, God looks pretty good, don't he? He's pretty, he got him a pipe and a car and a drink, you know. All of a sudden, I didn't know this was going to happen. It's a good track. And uh, we're going to uh, get a couple more tissues out of it and uh, ask you to forgive me for my lightheartedness. And uh, I just believe that she's uh, rejoicing, so why should I be sad? Amen. Now, ask yourself this question. If I were to die today, if I were to die today, do I know that I know that I shout about it out? Do I know that I know I'm going to heaven? If you don't, can't say yes to that, there's only one other place left. And you do not. There's nothing in hell that you want. I ask them all the time, what the hell do you want? What? It's what the hell do you want? Are you crazy, preacher? Yeah. Nothing there for you. God loves you. Jesus died for you. And all you have to do is believe and receive. That's the way. That's God's will. Our Heavenly Father, thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the grace of God. Thank you for the Savior, the S-A-V-I-O-U-R, Savior, Deity, Son of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Who's there believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you, Lord. Now, Lord, with these folks with heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you a question with heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe someone saying, Pastor, if I die today, I don't know if I'm in heaven. Would you pray for me? I won't come to you. I won't embarrass you. But I want to pray for you. Anybody say, Pastor, I don't know that one heaven. Would you please pray for me? That God has used Linda's service to help me understand I need to be saved. Please pray for me. Anybody anywhere, Pastor, pray for me. Anybody. I won't come to you, I promise. Please, please pray for me. Anybody. I see the hand. God bless you, sir. Amen. Thank you for your honesty. Anyone else? I don't know. Pray for me. Pray for me. I see that hand. Pray for me, Pastor. I don't know. I'm not sure. Pray for me. Pray for me. Please pray for me. Anyone else? Anyone else? God bless you, sir. Amen. Thank you. I see the hand. God sees the heart. Now, in closing in prayer, I'm going to say to you, would you raise your hand? Would you raise your hand? Salvation isn't hard. It's not difficult. You do have to come to the end of yourself, so to speak, and say, Lord, not my will, but thy be done. Your will that I be saved. You want me saved. You set the Savior. And all you have to do is ask him to save you. And that's what he'll do. Simple prayer. The prayer don't save you, but believe in will. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as I pray and dismiss, thanking you for lending. Carol Coates' testimony. We pray for these, especially who raised her hand. All they have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I shall be saved in thy house. It's what the Lord uh, told the Apostle Paul. He told the jailer in Acts chapter 16. And they all receive Christ. It's believing, receiving. It seems so simple. Yet folks die and go to hell trying to figure it out. I pray, pray, Lord, that you would help us understand the simplicity of the gospel.
Jesus came, paid the price. All we have to do is believe on him. It's grace. Grace. Unmerited favor. We didn't do anything to deserve it, but the grace of God will save us. For by grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourself, the gift of God. Thank you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. They all Amen. said. Amen. Amen. I love you. I am your friend. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask me. If you want to fight, the guy in the booth back there is my sister pastor. He loves to fight, so you can see him. And uh, he knows a lot of you know, and he cares, and I know that. But anyway, I'm just kidding. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm here for you if you need me. And I'm as close as a phone call or a visit, whatever it is, I'm here. And I pray that you will, when you time comes, that you will, when you die, that you go to heaven. Not to heaven. All right? Let's do the next door. Did you say the blessing? Oh, really? Yeah. Say the blessing right now? No. Okay, let's say the blessing. Save time. Okay, save time. Follow <laughs> <laughs> Lord Jesus, we thank you for the food. <laughs> hands and labor and prepared it. Lord, next door, the bunch of time, we pray that you would uh, help this family, Lord, to have unity and love for each other. Love covers a multitude of sins. Thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. Thank you for the food. Amen? Amen. 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 All right.